My name is Dr. Melissa Barber. I am a 2007 ELAM graduate, part of the first cohort of U.S. trained graduates of the ELAM Medical School. I am author of 30 Days of Thanks, The Journey Towards Deliverance, and soon to be former program coordinator of the ELAM Scholarship um, at the IFCO office. I want to introduce you to my co-host and co-moderator this evening, Dr. Samira Adri. Hello, everyone. And my name is Samira Mifatu Adri, uh, and I will be co-moderating tonight's webinar with Dr. Barber. I'm proudly a 2020 graduate of ELAM, the Latin American School of Medicine. I'm from Gaithersburg, Maryland, by way of Accra, Ghana. Um, and I just got home from Cuba, actually, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you can imagine the adjustments, but most importantly, having spent the latter part of my final year, um, which is an internship year, uh, immersed in COVID-19 and witnessing firsthand Cuba's response, amazing response in the face of uncertainty, definitely makes it super easy to be proud of being among the Cuban trained cadre of physicians, uh, affectionately known as El Ejército de las Batas Blancas. This webinar will be exploring the responses to this pandemic in the US versus Cuba. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for all those of you who have joined us today, um, but just to put things into perspective, this is essentially a fight comparative to the biblical David and Goliath. And the pandemic's implications on both nations and the world at large have been sobering to say the least and a very serious wake up call as of uh, for all of us. As of today, uh, the U.S. stands at 6.3 million cases of COVID and about 189,000 deaths, um, according to the New York Times, uh, whereas, Co whereas Cuba stands at a total of 4,352 cases um, with 3,642 recoveries of those cases and 102 deaths. Um, so Cuba has its own share of challenges, uh, the 60-year blockade being a massive challenge, but the resilient spirit of the Cuban people uh, absolutely shows through this pandemic and is, it's done in such an organized and concerted effort nationally that it's very impressive. Um, so to start off, my colleague, Dr. Jaywa Weathers, will speak about how Cuba has successfully responded to the COVID-19 crisis. Hi, my name is Ajewa Weathers. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I um, just graduated from the Latin American School of Medicine. And during my sixth year, which was my intern year at school, uh, is when COVID reached the island. This was about the end of February that uh, COVID reached the island. And so as a result, they were able to mobilize pretty quickly and what was done is that there were designated hospitals that were seeing COVID patients or uh, suspected positive COVID patients. And um, I think that was very helpful because during that time, a lot of people weren't sure what was going on and they began to do that in response to everything that was going on. So in my case, I was an intern. I had just started the internal medicine rotation and we didn't have too many cases, but a few were popping up and most of them were from people coming into the country. And so at that point in time, it was easier to, uh, to figure out who was positive because of their recent travel. And then as soon as they were suspected cases or if they had any symptoms, that were a cause of alarm, they got tested. They were sent to that specific hospital that was attending COVID patients. They were tested and then from there, the, you know, uh, depending on what the results showed, they received treatment, they went into isolation or uh, they were allowed to go. Um, as we had a community spread, there were hospitals that anyone could go to if you had any symptoms. But what we had is like an isolated group that was specifically supposed to triage patients that came in with uh, symptoms 
associated with COVID as well as recent travel history. And so when that started happening, every hospital was welcoming patients, but you had a specific area where, one second, one second, where they had a specific area where uh, those who had cough symptoms, symptoms of the flu, and those who had recent travel, or those who had known contact with someone who had tested positive, would then be attended to by a specific group of people. And initially, I thought this was the best way to handle things because it was still new. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, protective equipment and gear. And so when, by doing it this way, we were able to have those who were attending to known or suspected COVID cases to have the appropriate equipment to attend to those patients. Those patients were evaluated at hospitals, at any hospital that they chose to come into. And then from there, if there was enough suspicion that they needed to be tested, they were then sent to the hospital that was specific for COVID. Eventually, all the hospitals were able to do a quick test. And so you can do a quick test and then uh, later on you would get other testing done. Another uh, area where students were involved in the uh, approach to the coronavirus was through Peskisahe. So I was a six year and so I was not required to do Peskisahe because we were still working. But anyone from fifth year down, they, what they did is Peskisahe, which is very common in Cuba, basically you do Peskisahe and when, you, when I say you do Peskisahe, is you, you go to specific houses, you're assigned a, a group of houses, maybe like 20 for the day. And you as a, a medical student, you go house to house and you ask for people, you ask people if they have any symptoms associated with, what, with whatever disease you're doing the pest pizza for. So in this case, we were looking for patients who had fever, who had symptoms of cough and who had any recent travel. And so, when that happens, usually it starts really early in the morning. You try to go so that you, at a time where we know that people will be home. And in this case, they had already started, um, uh, uh, they already started shutting things down. And so most people were home. And so basically you went door to door and asked how people were doing, if they had any alarming symptoms. And then you would refer them to the hospital. So that was really important. And I think that helped a lot because we were able to identify any cases. Not only were the hospitals open to anyone who, you know, had any symptoms or felt that they had come in contact with someone who was positive, but you also had doctors going into the community and also figuring out the population to which they attend if there was anyone there that had any symptoms. So it was beneficial because we were able to identify those cases or suspected cases and uh, treat them and get them the medical attention that they needed pretty early on. And I think that that had a huge impact on the reason why the numbers in Cuba never skyrocketed or never were so great compared to, you know, the amount of people, the population that's there. Because Cuba's population is very elderly. And so when that happened, people over the age of 60, I believe, were then told that they had to stay home. So that included a lot of our prophase, actually, but um, anyone who was 60 and anyone who had um, a weakened immune system due to a chronic disease that they may had, have were told to stay home. And so I think those uh, early preventative measures helped a lot because we never had, we, we had surges, but the, the number of people that tested positive versus the number of people that, um, that might have been hospitalized for the disease, I felt like were not that great compared to other countries. I think that they did a really awesome job uh, uh, making sure that they knew who to test and also that they made the test available to anyone and that they 
we gave people the information as far as what to do if they felt like they had symptoms. All of this was broadcasted on television. And um, you also knew every day how many people were affected in a specific, and they told you which areas specifically. So you could be aware of what was going on. Um, and I thought that that was really helpful at a time where uh, it's, it's, you know, things are confusing. This is a pandemic. It's a new virus. No one's, you know, heard of it before. They don't know what it means. You know, I think that they did a really awesome job in informing their population. And because of the relationship that the human people have with their medical system, they were able to act in a way, in, accor in accordance with what, you know, with the instructions that they were being given and with the information that they were being given so that they can best uh, 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 make sure that they uh, were keeping themselves safe and were also coming to the hospital when they, uh, when they thought it was necessary. And also getting the medical attention, um, even if they might not be able to go to the hospital, which was the whole idea with the FPC. I just wanted to give a little bit of my experience uh, having to do quarantine and also having students come to see, basically do PESVISA by coming to see if I was doing well during those 14 days that I had to be quarantined. And um, so uh, it was like, it was the, it was a position that I'm not normally in because usually we're the ones to do PESVISA. But I, I want to just say that as a, a student and and re a person who then had to receive the pesquisa, it was really, really, uh, it was really comforting to know that, um, you know, I am in self isolation, I am home, but it was really comforting to know that every morning someone would come and ask if I had fever and ask how I was doing and if there was any concern that I might have, I have a direct contact my di direct line to a physician in the neighborhood that could attend to me if there was anything going on. Um, I think that was really, really huge. And I think that was very comforting. And I definitely see why, um, why the uh, PESPISA works so well because of it. Um, the, uh, as, as far as uh, the preparation that I've had in Cuba, um, I feel, I feel like it's been awesome. I, I love my experience. I, um, I love the program. I love uh, the, uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to attend the school. And I feel like in this case specifically, I was very fortunate to be in Cuba during this time so that I could be better prepared when, wherever I go to face uh, uh, pandemics to face, uh, just outbreaks, different things that are not, I guess people don't consider them uh, common in the medical field. Everyone was, you know, taken aback by the fact that we had this pandemic. And the fact is, you know, these things will happen again. And so I feel really, really prepared because I have a plan of attack. You know, I think, um, Preparation is key, and the really great part of our education is that we're trained in disaster medicine from third year. We have a class on it, and we get it again fourth year, and we also get it again fifth year. And so as soon as something like this happens, there are already, uh, there are already things in place so that we can react really quickly and react with the most information that we we need and that we can and information that'll be helpful for us. But um, I think just having a plan really, really helps. And Cuba has a really, really great system in place that's been there. You know what I mean? They, they have a system that's a part of their medical training. So with that, with taking that into consideration, I feel like I'm, I'm a great, a well-prepared physician for anything that would occur because it's been part of my training. So, so dealing with the pandemic is no different than learning how to treat a patient who has a chronic illness. And so um, I'm very appreciative for that. And then I think with me being in Cuba during that time, I was able to see that actually 
in motion in real time as opposed to learning about it and um, in class. We want to say thank you so much to Dr. Ajaywa Weathers, who could not be here with us. Send her all of your hugs and your love as she is in a class preparing to take her board. So she's going to need all of your prayers, all of your well wishes. Send them her way. Um, now we have Dr. Emily Brown, who is a 2017 Elam graduate. She is currently in her last year of residency at the University of Massachusetts and a family med medicine resi residency. She is the product of being from an underserved background and what Elon can do when a student takes advantage of the wonderful scholarship opportunity. Dr. Emily Brown will be speaking on uh, the contract contrast of Cuba's approach to tra treating COVID-19 within, within the U.S. and the U.S. response uh, to the virus. Dr. Emily Brown. Thank you. Yes, this is my third year back in the U.S. after graduating from Elam, and I'm still adjusting every day to life in the States. I'm honored to speak tonight. Although the failing of the U.S. COVID response is not an uplifting or an easy subject to discuss, whether individual or collective, failure is opportunity in disguise, an invitation to reflect, learn, and grow. It is hard to see opportunity within tragedy. However, it is there nonetheless waiting for us to take action. The failings of the US COVID response illustrate the problems of the US healthcare quote unquote system overall, lacking in prevention, unevenly distributed, and prioritizing personal gain over population health. During this presentation, I will discuss these shortcomings with stories from my personal experience. Lacking prevention. From the start of the pandemic to present day, the US population has received conflicting information about COVID-19 depending on our news sources, which are in turn dictated by our political leanings. This is a huge barrier to prevention because preventative measures won't be taken by those who think the virus isn't real or isn't cause for concern, and the actions of any impact the health of many in our world. In early spring, I experienced the first death of a hospitalized patient under my care due to COVID-19. They were relatively young and healthy and would almost certainly be alive today had they not contracted the virus. Deaths due to COVID-19 complications became a daily occurrence at my community hospital in Massachusetts throughout April and May. The day after I witnessed that first COVID-19 death, a patient in my clinic asked me if people were making too big a deal out of the virus, to which I thought to reply, the dead ones aren't. Instead, I patiently stated the facts. People are getting sick and dying, and I reviewed recommendations to prevent infection with my patient. Prevention is always more effective and economical than treatment. However, when it is too late for prevention, treatment takes a stand. Physicians are limited or supported by the systems within which we work. It is especially challenging to do humane work in an inhumane system, as any physician who has established an effective medication regimen for their patient with chronic disease, only to have insurance no longer cover it, will tell you. In the early days of the pandemic, when my outpatients called to report COVID-19 symptoms, I did what was available and recommended, told them to stay home, monitor themselves, prevent viral spread, and call me if they experienced worsening symptoms such as shortness of breath, while we collectively scrambled to flatten the curve, transition to telehealth, create services for patients with COVID-19 and homelessness, and adapt to ever-changing access to testing. It was terrifying to tell my patients to monitor themselves especially knowing that oxygen levels can be dangerously low in COVID-19 without outward manifestations until it is too late. I was scared that my patients would die at home alone and without a fighting chance. In Cuba, patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 are admitted to hospitals dedicated to COVID patients. As we heard from Dr. Weathers, this centralization of cases keeps sick people out of the community and ensures that they are appropriately monitored and receive the support that they need. Sick patients are hospitalized in Cuba, not because they meet inpatient criteria as dictated by insurance companies in the US, but because it is the right thing to do. While caring for hospitalized patients in the US, I navigate between suspected COVID, confirmed COVID, and non-COVID patient rooms within the same day, worried that I might transmit the virus from COVID patients to non-COVID patients despite my best efforts as I dispose of some PPE items, such as gowns and gloves, and reuse other parts such as masks and face shields. For COVID-19 patients who qualify, I'm able to give convalescent plasma and remdesivir, and if treatment fails, I have a dedicated iPad so that family members 
may witness their loved ones' last moments from a safe distance. These seemingly advanced therapies and technologies fall far short of what prevention provides, the thing that we take for granted, our lives. In the US, I can provide state-of-the-art therapy and ventilators for when my patients can't breathe, but I can't protect them from what landed them in the hospital in the first place, a system that does not prioritize prevention. I can do a lot for my patients, but I can't always protect them from misinformation determined by which online rabbit hole they get funneled into. As a doctor, I rely on the universal language of science. However, science has been thrown by the wayside by many of my fellow US citizens, depending on which side of the political divide they identify with. Lack of social support also contributes to the failing of the US COVID response. Many of my hospitalized COVID patients experience barriers to prevention because they cannot afford to miss work or are incarcerated. While breaking down the racist prison industrial complex may be beyond the scope of this presentation, increased depth and breadth of social services desperately needed for the healing of our deeply wounded society. It's desperately needed. If we stay silent about these injustices, we are part of the disease instead of the cure. Distribution. Many of us are well aware that there is an uneven distribution of health, health resources in the US and have personally felt the burn of this disparity during times when we have been uninsured, underinsured, between jobs, or received an unexpected medical bill despite having insurance. The US COVID response exhibited an uneven distribution of PPE depending on personal connections between local and federal government agents instead of simple need in a display of spite and greed. In the US, the inhabitants of a single apartment building have widely varying access to healthcare, information, and hygiene. This is a microcosm of the US healthcare system where a population is only as healthy as its sickest member. Some of my patients who were taking precautions to prevent infection got sick with the virus because their neighbors were not taking the same precautions. Access to testing has greatly improved over the past few months. However, lack of testing is a perpetual problem in the US and varies greatly by location. As a primary care physician in the US, the uneven distribution of resources poses barriers to care compared to the Cuban system where patients and PCPs have reliable access to each other because they live within walking distance of each other. Cuban PCPs collect population health statistics at the community level, seamlessly identifying and confining disease outbreaks as the PCP is able to alert neighbors within the vicinity of the outbreak at the onset, screen for symptoms, and keep a close watch on their most vulnerable patients. Cuba is an example of a single payer healthcare system with a streamlined data collection process. In the US, we don't have anything close to that. I was unaware of COVID outbreaks dangerously close to my patients because infections were occurring under a plethora of different providers and amongst patients without a medical home, even though they lived under the same roof. In the US, my patients and I struggle with a lack of access to transportation for inpatient in-person visits and lack of reliable phone access for telehealth visits. Another barrier to COVID prevention in the US is that my patients span across numerous different counties and state lines, subjecting them to different recommendations based on local guidelines because we still do not have a national policy to support prevention despite the ongoing pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic illustrates the impact of the news on health. In Cuba, the news is intended to inform, whereas in the US, it is intended to advertise. It would make my job a lot easier as a PCP if my patients received clear messages about health instead of sensationalist programming designed to hold their attention long enough to sell products, an example of putting profits before people. Despite the 180 degree difference between the Cuban and US healthcare systems, medical school in Cuba helped prepare me for the pandemic because I practiced adaptability, clinical diagnoses, disease prevention, patient education, and became accustomed to infectious, infectious disease outbreaks such as dengue, Zika, and cholera during my time in Cuba. And a prime example of a Cuban trained doctor providing Cuban style care in the US during the pandemic is our own Dr. Melissa Barber, who assessed the health of her community in the South Bronx, where she went door to door to identify vulnerabilities and provide resources where they were needed most. At the same time, my outpatient rotations were canceled and I was sent to work in the critical care unit, critical care unit losing battles that could have been won by prevention under a more uniform healthcare system. Prioritizing personal gain over population health. The US healthcare quote unquote system is designed to generate profits for the few at the health expense of the many. This is built in and deep rooted and will not go easily, but we must overhaul it if we are to receive the type of healthcare that we all deserve, the coverage enjoyed by citizens of dozens of other countries, instead of the inadequate patchwork of for-profit entities which allow patients to fall through the cracks. The US COVID response illustrates not only the deficiencies of the US healthcare system, but the inefficiencies of the political system as well. 
Politics play a major role in the U.S. COVID response. The world continues to witness the top tier of the U.S. government denying, lying, and blaming instead of informing, addressing, and collaborating. The COVID-19 pandemic makes the news, but our society also suffers from epidemics that don't make the news, such as the absence of social policies to protect our most vulnerable, which I was reminded of today when I saw a patient with a one-month-old baby girl who was also working full-time, anxious about the effects that caring for her infant were having on her job. She has already developed complications from sleep deprivation, anxiety, and depression because she lives in the only developed country in the world that does not provide paid parental leave. We don't need to tolerate this barbaric system indefinitely. I'm hopeful that I will see advancement in social policies within my lifetime. In conclusion, the system in which we work matters. The best of physicians with the best of intentions are barred from doing their best work within a healthcare system which prioritizes profit over patients. We must understand our socioeconomic political system if we are to be effective within it and affect change within it. We can and we must transform the US healthcare system to serve our best interests, to demand health insurance that does more than ensure its own interests. We all deserve a system which supports prevention, is uniformly distributed, and puts patients before personal gain. Universal coverage is vital to prevention because, as the pandemic demonstrates, as a whole, we are only as healthy as our sickest member. Let us use the failings of the US COVID response as an opportunity to create a more humane healthcare system. This gathering tonight is a humble part of that worthy vision. And I thank you for being a part of the cure, for contributing towards a healthcare system which cares about the health of all of us, which understands that we are all connected. Si se puede, yes we can. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Emily Brown. We're so grateful to hear your perspective regarding this crisis, uh, especially while completing your residency program. Uh, we definitely are in full agreement with you uh, in your call to action. This is a, a task that it requires all hands on deck and uh, everybody contributing what they can to make this, this country and this world a better place for all, for all of us. But now we will shift to a, a brief message by Alex Skeeter who is a current six-year alum student offering another beautiful presentation, um, although this one was presented at the Garvey Festival this year um, in Milwaukee. Uh, and it's, it's a presentation that shows what studying at alum has afforded her and so many of us. Um, and it's a demonstration of the Cuban commitment to spreading love and solidarity through medical diplomacy around the world. So here's a clip from Alex Skeeter. Marcus Garvey said, I trust that you will so live today as to realize that you are masters of your own destiny, masters of your fate. If there's anything you want in this world, it is for you to strike out with confidence and faith in self and reach for it. Milwaukee, it is my hope that in 2020, we continue to realize this for ourselves and for our city. My name is Alexandra Skeeter, and I was asked to share a message with Garvey Fest on behalf of the Wisconsin Coalition to normalize relations with Cuba. Because for the past six years, I have been studying to become a doctor at the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, Cuba, started by Fidel Castro in 1998 as a response to the growing need for accessible, preventative, holistic healthcare worldwide. Growing up on the north side of Milwaukee in a biracial family, my dad taught me to be proud of being black. This lesson fueled my love for my education and fueled my love for my people. Less than 5% of the medical doctors in the United States are black, and only 2% are black women. I am humbled and honored to be able to increase these percentages and do what my ancestors were capable of doing but didn't have the opportunity to. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we've all witnessed the incredible Nobel Peace Prize worthy humanitarian relief efforts of Cuba's Henry Reeve International Medical Brigade. Just one example of the medical advances and support that Cuba has contributed to the medical community worldwide, despite the extremely inhumane and oppressive economic blockade imposed by the US. Imagine what Cuban medicine could do without limitations. This is why we must continue to call for the end of the economic blockade. Not only does the blockade negatively affect Cubans, it affects all of us. It has the greatest impact on Black Americans and Black folks worldwide. 
I'll explain three ways Cuba's healthcare system has made advances that would improve health outcomes for the Black community. In Cuba, healthcare is accessible to all people, which contributes to the country's high life expectancy rate. It is even comparable to that of the United States. Cuba is able to achieve these health outcomes at one third of the cost the United States spends because its healthcare system prioritizes the health of its population over the wealth of corporations. Here in the United States, hospitals face understaffing and are being forced to close because they are deemed to not turn a profit. These are issues you do not see in Cuba, and in fact, you see the exact opposite. Cuba continues to see days without new COVID cases and has not stopped exporting doctors around the world during this global crisis. Cuba is even willing to provide medical care to U.S. citizens, which would benefit black and brown communities that are disproportionately affected by coronavirus. But of course, the blockade prevents this from happening. Every year, diabetes claims the lives of thousands of black Americans and almost one million U.S. citizens are diagnosed with diabetic foot ulcers, a condition that increases the risk of lower limb amputations. Annually, an estimated 60,000 people in the U.S. undergo diabetic foot amputations, many of which could be prevented by the Cuban advancements recently made in this field of study. In 2015, Cuba eliminated the transmission of HIV and syphilis between mother and child. Medical advancements like these are especially important to note as HIV and syphilis also disproportionately affect Black and African people. One of the directors of the World Health Organization noted that eliminating the transmission of a virus is one of the greatest public health achievements possible, and that this is a major victory in our long fight against HIV and sexually transmitted infections, and an important step towards having an AIDS-free generation. However, because of the economic blockade, many do not have access to these life-saving treatments. Marcus Garvey reminds us that with confidence, you have won before you have started. And so I leave you with all the pride, confidence, and determination Cuba has taught me and invite you to reflect on what being in solidarity with Cuba and the Black community looks like in your life. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. We thank Alexandra Skeeter for that wonderful presentation. Um, if so many of us just get this in our heads, how important it is to have access to healthcare, how important it is for us to shout from a bullhorn about just the need for prevention, right? And how much that will make a difference in so many of our lives. Um, with that, we um, are about to introduce uh, a documentary called Dare to Dream. This documentary was done by a current board member of ISCO Pastors for Peace, Jennifer Wager. Um, she put this wonderful documentary together to highlight Imam from the perspective of a student, a graduate, and to highlight the wonderful things that graduates have been able to do here in the U.S as they have taken the opportunity of the Elam Scholarship. Um, this clip, we're gonna show a, a four minute clip of Dare to Dream. We want you to know that Dare to Dream is available online. Please, please, please use this uh, tool, as we call it, as a means to spread the word about Elam. We are currently in an application season. We want students who are very inter interested in the scholarship to come and apply to the scholarship. We want them to know about the availability of this scholarship. We do many things via uh, word of mouth, via social media and online, but we need your help as much as possible uh, to get the word out about this scholarship program. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, Cuba offered to send doctors. I was in my second year of Elam and I can remember there were Cuban doctors prepared and ready to go to New Orleans. They were staying with us at Elam, and they had their backpacks, which were full of medications, and they were ready to go to New Orleans and, and serve. Eso forma parte de que Cuba ayude al mundo. 
precisamente de, de los orígenes de nuestra revolución, de, de la sangre que llevamos los cubanos eh, de ayudar. They know that they physically cannot put Cuban doctors everywhere, but they can train people from these countries to learn the Cuban healthcare system hands on and to go back to their countries. Sobre esa base, pues vamos a extenderlo a todas partes del mundo. No solamente con la prestación de los servicios de los médicos cubanos, sino también con la formación de los recursos médicos de otras partes del mundo y que luego de formados puedan brindar los servicios eh, de manera eh, gratuita con todos los valores que aprendieron acá en sus comunidades. ELAM, the Latin American School of Medicine, was formerly a naval base located in the outskirts of Havana that was converted into a medical school by the Cuban government. President Fidel Castro came to the United States to address the United Nations. It was really at that time that he extended this offer to provide these scholarships to young people in the U.S., with the only understanding being that when they returned home, they would practice medicine in underserved communities. In the year 2000, IFCO was leading a delegation of Congressional Black Caucus members to Cuba to learn more about the reality there. And it was then that Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson remarked about the incredible health disparities in Mississippi. I said, look, we are willing to grant a number of scholarships for youth Pobre from de su your distrito, support, uh, youth from your districts que no puedan pagar los 200 mil dólares que cuesta una carrera universitaria. When Fidel Castro initially made the offer, it was of course seen as a wonderful uh, gift, but I think that there were really many people who didn't believe that it was possible. It was my father, the late Reverend Lucius Walker, who was the executive director of IFCO at the time, who believed that this was indeed something that could be done. And it was through his efforts that IFCO actually developed a process for recruiting, mentoring, and nurturing these students throughout their six to seven year medical school uh, training. Lucio era un hombre preocupado por todo, ¿me entiendes? Entonces, esa gente para uno tiene un valor tremendo porque te enseñan a cómo conducirte, a cómo comportarte con el prójimo. Por eso uno admira tanto a Fidel, a Lucio. And he did this because he really recognized the value that this program would offer not only U.S. communities, but the young people who would become these doctors, many of them young people of color. Thanks to Reverend Lucius Walker for opening that door and fostering that relationship and, and defining solidarity. The students we have brought, los estudiantes que hemos traído, come not only to study medicine, no solo para estudiar medicina, but to learn from Cuba, sino también para aprender de Cuba, how to build a better world. You can't help but smile every time I see the Dare to Dream uh, video. Uh, thank you for sharing that clip. Um, we will now segue into a very important moment in this webinar. As many of you know uh, and remember exactly 10 years ago, yesterday, September 7th, uh, our beloved Reverend Lucius Walker transitioned. And every year since 2010, many of his loved ones and friends around the world, and especially in Cuba, commemorate his passing and his life and legacy uh, continue to teach us volumes about the immense work we have inherited and that we must dedicate ourselves to fulfilling. So we will now share a photo montage of Reverend Walker.
uh, the man that lives in our hearts, uh, such a giant. As US alum students and graduates, we hold Reverend Walker in a special place in our hearts because we would not have the privilege of studying medicine if it was not for this great man and our Cuban friends. Um, last year, the then second year cohort of US alum students presented a beautiful poem honoring Dr. Uh, Reverend Walker at the Reverend Walker Memorial Dinner. Um, so we have the great pleasure of sharing with you all that very poem performed by current third year student, Kelvin Rojas. Uh, Kelvin is a hip hop artist and third year medical student at Elam, hailing from Harlem, New York. He writes to encapsulate his experiences and uplift the, the issues that afflict young people in America. He writes America with triple K for you to understand his perspective. And he sees art to be something that is made for many reasons, but the most relevant to him being to save uh, people as medicine does, um, but in this respect for the, vo vo for the voiceless. So we will have this clip now of Kevin, Kelvin performing the poem that was a, a cohort effort from last year's Memorial Dinner. For the desire Fidel is spended, even to whom the people may consider undeserving, we strive to exhibit the dream of a man who made it possible for us to be here. For we are the crusaders of whom Fidel spoke, the shepherds, the missionaries dedicated to the people's health. And as we embark on this journey, may we always remember the dream, not for some, but healthcare for all, regardless of where we may reside. And may we remember the vision you created for both the poor and the rich, because without your tenacity and your dedication to the people, we ourselves will be unable to attend to our own. And let us not forget, may you rest in eternal happiness, Reverend Lucius Walker, for you shattered a barrier and intertwined two worlds. You who spoke for those who felt they had no voice, fighting for the rights that granted us this opportunity, for standing up when your own country pushed you down, disseminating the notion of there being a no, destroying it, turning what was obsolete into a manifestation. And Miss Walker, don't ever think you go unnoticed, carrying the torch lit by your father and Fidel, making a name for yourself. We know the work is neither superficial nor without struggle, but we see your activism and dedication to keep the dream afloat. Inspired by that, we strive to one day do the same, to be the vessel of change for the people of our communities, standing on the shoulders of these giants. Continuously, we strive to change the tide, swimming against the current. We learn through a system at times unsuitable by sight, but all too suitable for knowledge, dissolving the idea of the, um, the minority being lesser than, using our stethoscopes as weapons and knowledge as power, applying the skills learned at a bay that still harbors hope, bringing back a world where healers heal bodies, where bodies heal souls. We stab back at those that attempt to destroy what you have designed, defining our version of activism, one body at a time. Rest in peace, Revolutious Walker. We thank Calvin for that wonderful poem. Um, I'd just like to share a few words about just Lucius Walker, Reverend Lucius Walker. For many of you who knew him, he was a brother, he was a leader. For those of us at Elam, he was a mentor. He was a father to many of us. He was a counselor. And as many of you knew, um, and as Gail would share the story very, very often, um, this is a man who was not encouraged to seek after education. As he was growing up, he was told to take another path by people who did not believe that people of color were actually able to be successful professionals. So we watched, I watched, as this man, this leader, this great person fought 
for this scholarship program to be available because he knew that our communities needed us young people to come back and give and serve and love on our people. And we needed to be able to take the opportunity that will be given to us by Iran and take it and run with it and thrive with it. So as you have seen tonight, so many of the graduates who have spoken, so many of the students who have spoken and have shared their heartfelt testimonies about just what Elam has done, we pay homage to Reverend Lucius Walker for all that he did in fighting to make this vision possible when nobody would help him, when nobody would stand and fight. He was a voice that broke through barriers, as Kelvin said, and he made it possible with Fidel Castro to make this scholarship available for U.S. students throughout the United States. And we thank him, we love him, we say rest in peace. With that said, we welcome our next guest to speak, Dr. Abraham Vela. Dr. Abraham Vela is a 2016 Elon graduate he grew up between Guatemala and the U.S. He is currently in his third year of family medicine, um, of, of a family medicine residency at Pomona Valley Hospital in Southern California. Um, Rev, uh, Dr. Vela will talk about Cuba's international missions to fight COVID-19 and past infectious diseases, as well as the Saving Lives campaign to bring Cuban medical collaboration to the U.S. Here is Dr. Abraham Hi, everyone. Hopefully you could all hear me. It's thank you again for uh, having me here. It's great to see all of you. It's great to see Dr. Emily Brown. I haven't seen her in, in a while and it's good to connect with people through here. Uh, like I always do, thank you all for the work that you do. I think uh, solidarity with Cuba is just uh, one of the greatest form of uh, humanity and uh, about the humanity that you all have. We all know how great Cuba has been to the world and and a lot of people haven't been so great to Cuba. A lot of countries haven't been so great to Cuba and, and for Cuba to be able to continue to provide the solidarity that it has uh, is really truly a humanistic mission. Uh, one that uh, we were trained under and I'm very proud when people ask me, when my patients ask me, what medical school did you go to? Really proudly, I tell them, you know, the Latin American School of Medicine, Havana, Cuba, and and uh, oftentimes it's a surprising reaction, usually a positive reaction. Uh, so it tells me that the work we're doing, getting the word out there and breaking myths about Cuba is working at, at some level, and, and I appreciate all of that. So thank you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Cubans' internationalism. Uh, starting with the uh, Henry Rio Brigade, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It was a brigade that was actually founded in 2005. Its it, mission was to come to the U.S. after Hurricane Katrina and aid uh, with the hurricane. As we all were, the Bush administration denied that care, and unfortunately, a lot of lives were lost in Katrina because in New Orleans because of Hurricane Katrina. And um, fortunately, Cuba has been able to use this brigade to provide the internationalistic and humanistic uh, work that it does to other countries in need. Um, it, just in Latin America, they are in about 22 countries uh, during this COVID pandemic and expanding above, uh, beyond Latin America, countries in Africa, even in Europe and the Middle East have benefited from the collaboration with uh, the Cuban government and the Cuban doctors. Um, that's how and I think I saw a question in the Q&A, how do we respond to U.S. accusations of Cuba using these doctors as human trafficking? And, and, and I find that so offensive, so, so offensive, so hypocritical of the U.S. to accuse of Cuba of something like that. A country that sends real human beings that are going to cure and to collaborate with other countries instead of sending soldiers with guns, bombs. How dare the U.S. accuse of Cuba of something like that? And and I think it's it's very important for all of us to to clarify that when when we encounter, just with patients or with anybody on 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 the street in a daily basis, just really clarify that and put that into people's heads. You know, um, to think about what I just said: who sends doctors and who sends bombs? Um, 
it really leaves people in awe and uh, it makes them curious to find out more about the Cuba and the Cuban revolution. So the Henry Reeve Brigade not, is not only sent to countries to collaborate medically, but Cuba has sent uh, professionals, not only health professionals, this includes teachers, engineers, uh, epidemiologists, public health workers, artists even, to many different countries to not only aid, but to train the people from that country uh, to be able to create more spaces that will be able to help their own population in the future. That was kind of the purpose of ELAM, to bring young minds from uh, the most vulnerable parts of the world, starting with Latin America, to be able to go back and provide health services to our own country uh, in places where usually they weren't able to receive any medical care. So the Cubans not only send people to aid, but like I said, it really helps establish a, the spaces that a lot of countries need, that people in a lot of countries need, people that are refused services by their own government. Uh, so it goes more beyond just going, putting a bandit in and leaving. Uh, it goes more than just charity work. It is really a humanistic approach to, to life, really. Um, wanted to talk about the importance of, of the Saving Lives campaign. I'm sure you all heard about it, and I'll let you give you a little bit more information how you can find out more and, and be involved. But the, the Saving Lives campaign has a few points that we're fighting for here in the U.S. Uh, first of all, is medically encourages the, the trade of scientific information, of support, of uh, using medications and trials, not only in the U.S., but also in Canada. And it's something that the whole world will benefit from, really. We, we know that Cuba has medications that, as U.S. citizens, you don't have access to. Not in the U.S. because you got to pay for it and often you can't afford those medications, but they're just not made in the U.S. I'm going to use the example Everpro P. I know in the video we saw how many people get amputated because of diabetes in the U.S. And you imagine the impact this, something like this has on a person emotionally, physically, mentally. It actually decreases a person's life expectancy to use a limb. And if we could prevent that using the medication Everpro P, which is created in Cuba, is used in Cuba, it could prevent up to 73% of amputations. Imagine how many people will benefit in this country from that. I'm sure we all know somebody with diabetes and probably a lot of us know somebody who's had an amputation. Uh, other medications like uh, for the Simovax vaccine, which helps prevent the metastasis of lung cancer. Another medication used for vitiligo uh, it's, it's just, it goes above and beyond. And to increase collaboration between all countries, we really just benefit everybody. I think the U.S. might benefit even more uh, than Cuba from collaborating with us. Um, the thing is, when you think about why don't we do that, we're still stuck with this mentality of the Cold War where we have to break communism. We have to beat socialism. We have to keep combating. I heard this, a nurse actually speaking behind me she didn't realize where I went to med school, I think. And, and she said, I'm looking for a house out of California before it becomes more communist. And I just, I couldn't believe it what I was hearing. I'm like, you will be lucky if we become more like Cuba. You would not be looking for another house if we became more like Cuba. And, and to me, it was just astonishing the, the lack of information, the ignorance that, that people have still in this country. Um, but anyways, so... That's one of the benefits, not only medically, but scientifically. Uh, Cuba will benefit from being, having access to more resources. Most importantly, the Saving Lives campaign is continuously fighting to end the economic blockade uh, against Cuba. And I think it's not just an economic blockade, I think it's a mental blockade as well that the U.S. imposes on Cuba through the media, through the propaganda. And uh, we all know the magnitude, the the Magnet the magnetic effect that the blockade has on Cuba. Uh, we all live, us that went to Elam, we, we've been there, we lived under a blockade for six or seven years. We know that it's not easy. We know it, every day can be a battle. And for Cuba to strive to, to be beating COVID the way it is right now compared to the US is really astonishing. Uh, I was reading an article of how aggressive they have been with COVID. And, and we've seen it, we see it every year when we go out and we find we deal with the dengue epidemics and, and that approach to medicine, us going into a community, us not only working in a community, but working with the community 
has been super successful and we see it work in Cuba. I one day hope that I can see that work in this country. I one day hope that people will open up not only their minds, but their hearts to an approach like that. Um, so the other thing that the Saving Lives campaign is uh, encouraging for is the uh, interferon uh, uh, medication, the interferon gamma medication in Cuba, which has been used to fight COVID as well. Um, unfortunately here, it's, it's not mentioned at all, not only in, in the media, I, I speak to infectious disease specialists and they're not really familiar with it. And to me, it's, it's a little astonishing because Cuba has had that medication for many, many years. It's actually not a new medication and um, it's not known here. And uh, again, I think there's economic reasons for that. And uh, something that the Saving Lives campaign is pushing for is for the U.S. to allow trials for that medication here. Um, it, I think it, it's worth it. I think it's worth finding more options than what we have right now. And um, obviously what we're doing is not working. It, it's obvious. And uh, this pandemic has really taken the mask out of this country and really shown its true colors. It's really shown what capitalism, how devastating it could be uh, to a society as a whole. Um, so I encourage you to please um, follow the Saving Lives campaign. If you want to get involved or endorse it, if you work in an organization, if you want to pass on more information, please email us, savinglives at us-cubanormalization.org. Uh, hopefully John can, or I could put the, the email address uh, here in the chat for all of us to have. Uh, finally, again, I just want to thank you all. Thanks for all the work that you do. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions about Elam, the Savings Life campaign, uh, what else we could do here at home to, to tackle this pandemic. And not only the pandemic, this is just one thing that happened that really, like I said, took the mask off the U.S. You know, I've never imagined myself sitting down with a patient and, and half the visit talking about lack of access to food, lack of access to transportation, lack of access to home. These are things, in theory, we should not be having to deal with. Unfortunately, we have to as primary care doctors because no one else does. And at the same time, we're so limited onto what we could offer and provide because of the way our healthcare system is set up, because our educational system is set up, the way our housing is set up, the way our society as a whole is set up. So I think hopefully with, with this crisis that we're dealing with, I hope people can react and, and start taking more, um, uh, learning more, just learning more and about other things that we could do. There's other ways to, to, to live with a society. So uh, thank you all again.